The subject of today's session was a consequence of a question that was put to me initially a couple of years ago by a dear friend of mine who's a pastor in the United States. It was a time when, in particular, people of faith were feeling especially beleaguered in the United States. And he asked me this question. He asked me to revisit it in a somewhat expanded manner in a talk that I gave to his congregation on my recent lecture tour to the United States. And I think it has a lot of messages that are relevant to us all. And I'll also add, perhaps especially relevant this time of year, when it's awfully dark outside and we kindle the lights. So without any further ado, let's consider the questions. And on that basis, consider what it is that we have to say with respect to them. Sometimes we feel so surrounded by forces of godlessness that it seems hopeless for us to try to change them. We know God can annul these forces in an instant. Still, these forces seem invincible against all our earthly efforts. At times, it seems that the best we can do is just to batten the hatches and circle the wagons. American expressions. Withdrawing into ourselves to avoid being affected by the negative influences that constantly bombard us. What guidance can we glean from the Bible for our behavior at such times? And the second half, a related question. Again, realizing that God alone can and one day will vanquish these forces of godlessness, what does he expect of us? Should we be training ourselves just to wait patiently for him to intervene? Do we find role models in the Bible whom we can strive to emulate in formulating the appropriate strategy for confronting these challenges? And how does this strategy play itself out in God's ultimate plan? Finally, does this relate to the reconciliation beginning to take place between Jews and Christians today? Now, certainly a lot goes into these questions. And without any further ado, let's open up our Bibles. And in particular, consider the question of role models. People who exemplified that confrontation with a world surrounding them that was a world of godlessness. And I'd like to do so, if I may, in a progression. That is, since we're seeking precedence, first to consider the most immediate precedent, and then progressively, work our way back in history, the precedence of the precedence. So it's on that note that we'll consider first what we read in the book of Daniel in chapter three, where we read of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who when Nebuchadnezzar sets up his golden image for everyone to bow down to it, don't. And as we read in particular, beginning in verse 14, when they don't bow down, Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you serve not my gods, nor prostrate yourselves to the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, and alternatively, you are destined, that at what time you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, and so on and so forth, all the musical instruments, that you fall down and prostrate yourselves to the image that I have made, fine. But if you do not prostrate yourselves, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the 
burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God that shall deliver you out of my hands? To which they respond, O Nebuchadnezzar, the mighty king, we don't even have to answer you. We have no need to answer you on this matter. Behold, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. He can deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace and out of your hand. He can, and he may, may choose not to. But it doesn't make one bit of difference to us. If not, be it known unto you, O king, that we will not serve your gods nor prostrate ourselves to the golden image which you have set up. It doesn't make one bit of difference. Whatever is going to happen is immaterial. What matters is doing what's right. And doing what's right means standing up against evil. We're not bowing down. Period. And of course, a couple of verses later, Nebuchadnezzar commanded certain mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Now, of course, we know the end of the story. Yes, they were saved. There's a happy ending. But that was not a determinant in their course of action because they had no guarantee that that was going to be the final conclusion. They did what was right simply because it was right, irrespective of the consequences. But of course, as I already noted, besides simply noting the most proximate of examples that can serve as role models, as precedents, we seek the precedents of the precedents. So let's at this stage go one additional generation back. Jeremiah. Jeremiah's predicament is particularly poignant. And in a way, one could even say more difficult, more tragic than that of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Because the people surrounding Jeremiah, who to him do indeed represent his adversaries, are from among his own people. And this is a recurrent theme in the book of Jeremiah. I'm citing here from chapter 20, but indeed we could cite from many passages. The prophet says, I am become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. The word of God is made a reproach unto me and a derision all the day. And of course, we should stress that this isn't merely the inconvenience of being held up as a laughing stock. His life is in mortal danger. Indeed, in verse 10, we'll be returning to verse 9 in a moment. I have heard the evil report of many terror gathering around. Tell, and we will tell about him, denouncing. And indeed, we know that Jeremiah ends up in a pit, drowning in mud. Indeed, mortal danger. But returning to verse 9. I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But it was in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I weary myself to hold it in, but cannot. I can't hold back from speaking God's truth to a people who doesn't want to hear it. It doesn't make a difference. I speak God's truth to them. Now, we should note, Jeremiah also stresses, verse 11, God is with me as a dreaded, awesome warrior. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, because they have not prospered, even with an everlasting shame, which shall never be forgotten. But while that is, in some sense, an ultimate guarantee, does it guarantee anything in the here and now? Manifestly not. Again, Jeremiah's life is in mortal danger. And there were prophets who were murdered 
by their intended audiences who didn't want to hear the word of God. When Jeremiah speaks of God being with me as a dreaded awesome warrior, we hear a resonance of an idea that was expressed in earlier generations as well. When Elisha and his attendant are surrounded by the army of Aram, and when the attendant wakes up early and he sees a host with horses and chariots round about the city, and he exclaims to Elisha in the second book of Kings, chapter 6, in verse 15, What are we going to do? Elisha calms him down by assuring him, we have them outnumbered. They that are with us are more than they that are with them. And when Elisha then prays, in verse 17, is not even praying for God's salvation, it's just praying that the young man might see what Elisha already sees. And God opened his eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha, and indeed, they had the army of Aram outnumbered. And in a similar vein, when in the second book of Chronicles, verse 2 of chapter 32, we read that Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, and he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem. So, of course, King Hezekiah and all of his princes and mighty men go to work in setting up the defenses of the city. And as they go about their efforts, King Hezekiah assures them, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there is a greater with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. With us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Where again, the reassurance ultimately is unequivocally true. But does it provide any guarantee in the short term? We know that Sennacherib really did sweep into Judea and capture every major city in all the land, up to, not including, Jerusalem. That he laid siege to Jerusalem. And the reason that siege ended not in his favor was because God sent his angel to smite 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army in a single night. And the next morning, of course, Jerusalem was safe. But it's only because of an extraordinary miracle, and King Ezekiah doesn't have any guarantee at this point that such a miracle is going to be forthcoming. Nor did Jeremiah, again, recalling Jeremiah's words in chapter 20. No guarantee. But you don't do what's right because you are guaranteed of this worldly success only because you know that ultimately you are with God and will surely prevail. But in the here and now, it's just doing what's right because it's right, not because what will come of it. So we've considered the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've considered the case of Jeremiah, but we seek a much earlier precedent and we find it in Moses. Remember Exodus chapter 2. In it, we read of, in essence, three particularly significant episodes in the early life of Moses. First, in verse 11, when Moses went down unto his brethren, looked upon their burdens, he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and he saw there was no man, and he smote the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He doesn't remain silent. 
he acts. And the next day, he acts again, a different kind of challenge. He sees two men of the Hebrews striving together, and he said to him that did the wrong, why are you smiting your fellow? And for sticking his neck out or nose in, in this story, he gets a mouthful. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you think to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? And Moses realizes there are informants about. And the next verse, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Now, let's place ourselves to the extent that it's possible in the shoes of Moses. These two episodes were both instances in which he stuck his neck out, or varying the metaphor, he stuck his nose in to someone else's business in order to fight injustice. You'd think he'd learn his lesson. He is, after all, in Midian because he's running for his life, a fugitive because of these previous instances of intervention where maybe he should have just kept on the sidelines and not gotten involved. And his first day in Midian, he's sitting at the well and he sees the daughters of the priest of Midian, Jethro, coming to draw water. And the next thing, verse 17, the shepherds came and drove them away. Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. Is he crazy? I mean, after all, we don't know how many shepherds there were, but they were certainly plural. And he's one man, a stranger in a strange land, not a single friend around, a vagabond. And he goes to battle against all the shepherds because he sees them committing an injustice against these shepherdesses, Jethro's daughters. Why does he do it? On some plane, the answer necessarily is because he must. Because he cannot tolerate seeing injustice perpetrated and remain silent. In essence, although the Torah had not yet been given, his behavior resonates with Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16. You shall not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. So, as far as Moses is concerned, it isn't a question of what will be achieved, it isn't a question of what will be the consequences. It's a question of whether you are going to abide by injustice being perpetrated and remain silent. And Moses' unequivocal answer to that from the get-go is no, irrespective of the consequences. Moses gets up and acts. And, you know, it's in that vein that I'd like to call our attention to the odd formulation that we already read briefly in verse 12. He looked this way and that way, and he saw there was no man. Why did he look? So I know the conventional answer is he looked around to see if anyone was watching because he's about to smite the Egyptian. I'd like to propose an alternative understanding. In essence, precisely the opposite. Moses sees an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew. He sees a glaring, gross injustice being perpetrated here. So he looks around to see who's going to get up and act. Who is going to thwart this injustice being perpetrated? And he looked this way and that way, and he saw there was no man. Answer, no one. No one is acting. No one is going to stop this injustice. And at that very moment, it dawns upon Moses. He is the man. No one else. It's up to him to act. And the very next words report, he smote the Egyptian because there was no one else to do it for him. You know, ironically, Moses, by so doing, was emulating someone. He was emulating God. We find the exact same expression in Isaiah, Chapter 59, he saw, God saw, there was no man. 
and was astonished that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. And he put on righteousness as a coat of mail and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And God writes a world, writes R-I-G-H-T, rife with injustice. He doesn't wait for anyone else. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 63, I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the peoples, there was no man with me. Yea, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my fury for the day of vengeance that was in my heart and my year of redemption are come. And again, I looked and there was none to help. And I beheld in astonishment that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury had upheld me. God doesn't wait for anyone else. Well, neither does Moses. And on some plane, inevitably, we appreciate, neither should we. You do what's right because it's right. You don't wait for anyone else to do what's right. Because precisely the fact that there is no one else is the summons for you to stand up and be counted. As again, would Jeremiah, in delivering God's word, despite being in mortal danger. And would Chananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, despite the threats of Nebuchadnezzar to hurl them into a fiery furnace if they don't submit to him and his golden image. You do what's right, simply because it's right. But, you know, I'd like to still consider one additional precedent going even further back. I admit that this precedent is a little bit different and more subtle, but I think on some plane it helps to illustrate whence this attitude comes. In Genesis chapter 12, we read all about Abraham. We read God's summons to Abraham in the first verse. Go you out of your land and from your kindred and from your father's house unto the land that I will show you. And of course, Abraham does. As we read in verse 5, Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and, and I'm translating here literally from the Hebrew, the souls that they had made in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. Now again, rigorous translation. Asher asu v'charan, that they had made in Haran, which of course occasions a very obvious question asked in our tradition. How do you make a soul? We know God makes souls, but how could Abraham and Sarah make souls. And inevitably, that pertains to the mission that Abraham and Sarah launched in the world. You make a soul when you bring someone to God. It is, after all, in that vein that we read in Genesis chapter 18, we'll return to its context shortly, that God says prior to the doom of Sodom and Gomorrah, shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him to the end that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of God to do righteousness and justice, to the end that God may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. His children? Which children? True. Ishmael had already been born. Isaac had not. But on some plane, his children and his household, these aren't biological children. It is the realization that when you bring someone to God, that person becomes your spiritual child. It is undoubtedly in that vein that we consider in the second book of Kings chapter 2, an expression that indeed appears elsewhere in the Bible as well, 
the sons of the prophets. It appears repeated in here. Bands of prophets that were tending to the principal prophet. Of course, the principal prophet in context here was Elijah. They aren't biologically sons of the prophets. They're disciples of the prophets. The disciples are called children. The sons of the prophets that were at Beit El, those sons of the prophets that were at Jericho, 50 men of the sons of the prophets, and so on. And conversely, the same is true. The way the disciple relates to his mentor is as a father. So indeed, in the continuation of the same narrative, when Elisha sees Elijah being taken from him, he cries, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Ironically, just a few chapters later, Yoash, the king of Israel, upon seeing Elisha upon his deathbed, would exclaim exactly the same words, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So, when we consider these souls that Abraham and Sarah made, it was because of their proselytization mission to spread the word about God, to teach the world a recalcitrant world, a godless world, that there is one God. But you know, with that realization, inevitably there's a problem. All these people, these souls that Abraham and Sarah had made, what became of them? That is true in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 14, when Abraham goes in hot pursuit of the four kings in order to rescue Lot. He led forth his trained men born in his house, 318. These could well be the proselytes, but what happened to them? We never read about them again. In Genesis chapter 46, culminating in verse 27, and in Exodus chapter 1, Commenting in verse 5, we read that when Jacob comes down to Egypt with his entire entourage, there are only 70 souls, and they're all direct descendants of Abraham and Isaac. So what happened to everyone else? Let's conjoin to that question another one. There were righteous people who preceded Abraham and Sarah. What about Noah? In our tradition also, Shem, Eber. There were a number of righteous people in the earlier generations. We never encounter anything about their involvement in this proselytization mission. These questions conjoined, I remember, were presented by the rabbi of the congregation where I grew up as questions that had been presented to him when he was a youngster by one of his mentors in Europe. And the key to the answer, because indeed it is one answer that addresses both of these questions, we can glean from a subtlety that is perhaps only discernible when we consider the Hebrew original in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 17, God's summons to Abraham in the Hebrew is Hithalech Lefanai. Now, Hithalech could be translated as walk, but maybe more literally, go yourself. It's in the reflexive conjugation which is admittedly exceptional, especially for this verb. But this reflexive construction, go yourself, appears here in Genesis chapter 17 as God's summons to Abraham, go yourself before me. And we might note that we find exactly the same exceptional conjugation 
but in a very different statement. In Genesis chapter 6, with respect to Noah. In verse 9, we read, Et ha'elokim hitalech Noah. Noah walked, or went himself, with God. Not before God. God's charge to Abraham is, you go ahead, go yourself before me. Noah is only going with God. And the most obvious, tangible ramification of that, when God says to Noah, I'm bringing a flood to destroy all of humanity. Start building a boat. The weather is changing. What's Noah's response? Whatever you say, boss. And he starts building. And that's it. What about trying to reform humanity? What about launching a proselytization message? Noah doesn't do anything other than build the boat. And apropos of the questions that we asked earlier, maybe we can discern in this, on the one hand, some degree of exoneration of Noah by considering what happened to all the proselytes whom Abraham and Sarah had brought to God. What happened to them? They were never mentioned again. Evidently, they backslid into paganism and oblivion. Noah realized that almost inevitably would happen. So, so far as Noah was concerned, what's the point? So Noah just builds the boat. Abraham and Sarah knew just as well as Noah that the likelihood that these people would stay on board permanently was vanishingly small. If they would, it would be wonderful. That they didn't is tragic. But whether they will or they won't, proclaiming the message of God to a world that isn't ready to hear it is the right thing to do. And they do what's the right thing to do, irrespective of what it will accomplish. Not at all incidentally, by consequence. Even though there were earlier generations of righteous people before Abraham and Sarah, they, and only they, become the first patriarch and matriarch of Israel. Because they exemplify this message, that you do what's right, not because of what it accomplishes, but because it's right. That's all. And so, Abraham and Sarah launched their mission to reform humanity, even if humanity isn't going to become reformed. Noah, weather's changing, let's build a boat. That's it. Whatever you say, boss. Noah follows orders. Nothing more. You know, as a kind of postscript on this observation, people often like to get plaques with their names emblazoned upon them for their greatest this-worldly accomplishments. Well, Noah has a plaque of sorts. We read about it, after all, in Isaiah chapter 54. In verse 9, the flood is called the waters of Noah. Not exactly the kind of uh, plaque you might have liked that Noah's name is put on the flood with the implication that he didn't do anything to prevent it. Didn't lift a finger to try to reform humanity. Didn't do anything to try to avert that dire closure on a generation that had become bankrupt, but perhaps more damningly, that didn't have anyone to try to guide that generation back from the brink to God. There's another dimension that is also implicit in the distinction between 
Abraham and Noah. The distinction between go yourself before me and Noah went himself with, but not before, God. And that pertains not only to the mission to reform humanity, but also to striving to avert the decree of destruction, which after all entails getting into a fight with God. Noah didn't. God says, I'm wiping out all of humanity. Noah says, what were those blueprints for the boat? That's it. Whereas Abraham, in a similar set of circumstances, gets into a whole fight with God. Returning to Genesis chapter 18, from verse 23 and on, and Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And what if there are 50 righteous within the city? Will you indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That'd be far from you to do like this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that so the righteous should be as the wicked. That'd be far from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? An accusation. Accusing God. And Abraham continues bargaining down 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. Doesn't take an awful lot of brazen nerve to get into an argument with God like this? Of course, that's precisely what God wanted. Remember, we already noted that it is precisely in the verses that precede the ones that we just saw. That God says, shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be best in him. I'm not going to hide this from Abraham. I want him to get into a fight with me. I want him to do it. Because ultimately what God wants of us is to become not merely his servants, but his partners, his junior partners, but his partners. When you're merely an employee, you just follow orders. When you're a partner, you get into arguments. God wants Abraham to grow into himself as God's junior partner. Get into the argument. There's not a word of rebuke by God to Abraham for interceding on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. On the contrary, that's precisely what God wanted him to do. And in some sense, this really summarizes the essential summons of life. And it is most specifically the final word, literally the final word, in God's creation of the world. The final word of creation we read at the end of Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that in it he ceased from all his work that God created to do. That's what it says in the Hebrew. I realize the translation doesn't conform to the literal text in the Hebrew because it doesn't really make sense, but that's what the Hebrew says. Asher barai lokim la'asot. That God created to do. Well, why not just that God created? What is to do? And inevitably, on some plane, the implication is everything that God created, he created to do, to keep on doing because the world isn't finished yet. We have an ancient tradition that that dynamism of the work that still needs to be done comes to a kind of culmination in the first book of Kings, in chapter 7, verse 51, where we read, all the work that King Solomon wrought in the house of God was complete. And he uses the exact same word, that is, the word for work here, melachto, melacha, refers to creative labor. All of the melacha that God had made was to do, to keep on doing. Eventually to attain that completeness. Now, I submit to you that we can understand the 
juxtaposition of these two verses in two ways. One would be relatively trivial to say the world was all in some sense in abeyance waiting for the work to become complete and the work becomes complete when the temple is finished. And then I suppose we could all just go home. I submit that the message here is far more sublime. The completion of the temple symbolizes something. It symbolizes the capacity with which God endows us to create a divine space on earth, as it were, a habitation for God's presence. The pinnacle of human achievement is to take the terrestrial realm and elevate it to a heavenly plane. This is best exemplified in building the temple, but it's not finished then. This is precisely what we are all, always summoned to do. This is the very essence of our lives as God's junior partners, doing our utmost to inject godliness into this world, to uplift and exalt the terrestrial realm. And I would submit that in some sense, it is in this very vein that we understand the blessing that God charges the prophet Zechariah to deliver to Joshua the high priest. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my charge and will also judge my house and will also keep my courts, then, in the Hebrew, v'natati lecha mahalachim ben ha'omadim ha'ela. Translating literally, I shall give you walkers among these standing ones. Walkers, standing ones. What does it mean? Maybe because the expression seems so obscure, you have translations such as the previous one here, free access among those that stand by that completely ignore the literal text in the Hebrew. But we need to consider what does the Hebrew actually mean. But then, upon reflection, we can well appreciate. The walkers refer to man. The standing ones are the angels. God says, I will give you men who will be among the angels. But critically, it's important for us to appreciate the difference between man and the angels. That is, the angels are the ones who simply stand. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 1, their legs were straight legs. They turned not when they went. They went, everyone straight forward. Angels, don't bend. Don't change. Don't move. On an essential plane, angels are static. They are created as spiritual beings, and so they remain forever. At the opposite extreme, of course, the beast. The beast is created as a physical being, and so it remains forever. And man, man comes into the world as a physical being, a newborn baby, just physical, nothing spiritual, nothing spiritual actualized yet, but endowed with spiritual potential and the course of life is a summons to actualize that potential. So that for man, being able to enter into that junior partnership is the hallmark of human achievement, to actualize the potential that we have, to forcefully inject godliness into a world, even if the world isn't ready to hear yet. It is in a similar vein that we consider the words of Job chapter 5 verse 7 man is born unto labor as the flying beings fly upwards meaning the flying beings again are the angels 
they fly upwards. Their natural affinity is to transcendence. Man doesn't fly. Man climbs laboriously through toil, one step after another step, struggling to rise spiritually because there's so much that's holding us back. But so much within us that gives us the wherewithal to be able to nevertheless forge ahead, actualizing that spiritual potential that is, after all, the summons of us. And this, again, when we consider in broad outline, is precisely the message that we see in all of the individuals whom we have cited as role models. The wherewithal to be able to stand up and proclaim a message of God and of godliness, even when the world isn't ready to hear it. Abraham even recognizing that the mission will not succeed, doesn't hold back from proclaiming that message to a godless world. Moses, fighting injustice on every plane, irrespective of the inevitable realization that all it seems to be accomplishing is getting him into deeper and deeper trouble. Jeremiah and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, literally facing mortal danger, but proclaiming the, the message of truth, because that's the message the world needs to hear. On every plane, the realization, this is precisely the summons. This is the reason that we're here. And of course, inevitably, when we consider the implications, there's an additional dimension. That additional dimension maybe uh, more of a bird's eye view on life is God places us in this world to light the lights. Because the world is very dark out there and it's up to us to illuminate it. This is the charge that God gives us. In Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, it is perhaps best exemplified in the menorah, the candelabrum, in the sanctuary. You shall command the children of Israel that they bring unto you pure olive oil beaten for the light to cause a lamp to burn continually because it's a dark world and we need to illuminate it. And carrying that message of light into, shall we say, a more metaphorical sense. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, I, God, have called you in righteousness and have taken hold of your hand and kept you and set you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the nations. Because it's a dark world out there. To open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And likewise, in Isaiah chapter 49, he said unto me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And in verse 6, once again, I will also give you for a light of the nations, that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. And God makes this point very clear, unequivocally, explicitly. God's salvation isn't just for one individual or for a group of individuals or one people or a couple of peoples. It's that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. If you're not proclaiming the message loudly enough, for it to bring God's salvation unto the end of the earth, you're just not proclaiming the message loud enough at all. The summons, Isaiah chapter 60, Arise, shine, for your light is come, and the glory of God is shown upon you. And of course, this is such an imperative, precisely because the world around us is so dark. And, you know, at the same time, in a way, that we look around and we see this darkness so pervasive, is also an encouragement. Because we have an inkling of the game plan, the progression, as described in the words of the prophets. We'll start with 
Isaiah chapter 13. When the day of God comes, the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. In Joel chapter 2, the day of God comes, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, and in almost the same motifs as we saw in Isaiah chapter 13, the sun and the moon darken, the stars withdraw their brightness. In Joel chapter 3, likewise, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of God is come. And in chapter 4, the sun and the moon darken and the stars withdraw their brightness once again, for the day of God is near in the valley of decision. Likewise, in Zephaniah, in chapter 1, once again, a description of the day of God. And what is it? That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of ruin, a day of desolation, of darkness, of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. That motif of darkness is pervasive. But you know, we also know why there is that darkness. We turn to the prophecy of Amos, and of course, predictably, once again, we read that the day of God is darkness and not light, even very gloomy and no brightness in it. But in, in Amos chapter 8, we realize that that darkness, again in verse 9, I will cause the sun to go down at noon and I will darken the, the land in a clear day is because, as we read in verse 11, behold, the days come, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread, nor thirst for water, but to hear the words of God. Look around. You see that hunger and the thirst? People are so hungry and so thirsty, they don't even have a clue for what it is that they are hungering and thirsting. And as a result, they run from one stimulus to another, striving to assuage the hunger and the thirst because they don't even realize whence it comes and what the only way to satiate the hunger and thirst necessarily is. And so, as we read in the following verse, they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north, even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of God and shall not find it because they don't know where they're looking. That's the darkness. Now we know ultimately what will be the antidote to that darkness. Now, as we read it in Isaiah chapter 11, there shall go forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and a twig shall go forth out of his roots. The blessed day when the Messiah comes, when we will read in verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of knowledge of God as the waters cover the seabed. The thirst, not for water but for knowledge of God as the waters cover the seabed, will only be satisfied on that blessed day. And indeed, on that blessed day, even as in the prophecy of Malachi, the day comes, chapter 3, burning as a furnace, the day comes that shall set the willful sinners, and all that work wickedness ablaze. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness shine with healing in its wings in the day that I do make, says the God of hosts. So, you know, of course, we recognize the real illumination that 
sun of righteousness with healing in its wings is only in the end on that day of God's salvation. And of course, ultimately, it is in that sense that returning to Isaiah chapter 60, we read God's promise from verse 2 and on, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the peoples, but upon you, God will shine and his glory will be seen upon you and nations will walk at your light and kings at the brightness of your shining. In verse 19, the sun shall be no more your light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto you, but the Lord shall be unto you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. Now, again, certainly, that's the end. The blessed day of God. But, you know, it doesn't change the fact that the summons is still right now. The first verse of the chapter. Arise, shine, for your light is come and the glory of God is shown upon you. That's a mandate to shine. To shine so that everyone can be illuminated by that light. We don't wait until the end in order to obey that summons. That is God's charge to us on an ongoing basis, to be a light of the nations, to illuminate the world, that my salvation ultimately will be to the end of the earth. Now, God's salvation is to the end of the earth, but of course, it behoves us to stress. Where is that point of origin? Well, you know, we already saw in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. Remember the first part of the verse? They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Remember where God's holy mountain is? And indeed, in Joel chapter 3, after we read about the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of God is come, verse 5, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of God shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those that escape, as God has said, and among the remnant, those whom God shall call. So of course, inevitably then, when we speak of the summons to stand with God, to be God's junior partners, to broadcast the light, inevitably, we realize the light comes from here. In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to pass in the end of days that the mountain of God's house shall be established at the top of mountains and shall be exalted above hills and all the nations will stream to it. We know where that mountain is, don't we? This is the prophecy concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And many peoples shall go and say, go you and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah, teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and reprove many peoples. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into burning oaks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, we've noted these words in the past. I'm going to stress this point once again. The second half of verse 4, which we just read, is, of course, what is emblazoned on the Isaiah wall next to the United Nations. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and so on. We know. They failed so miserably, so spectacularly. Why did they fail? We've discussed it in the past. Because they made the mistake of beginning the citation in verse 4 and not in verse 3. How are we going to get to a world in which they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into burning oaks? 
As long as I want to get here and you want to get here, either I knock you out of my way or you knock me out of your way, and there'll never be peace. Peace becomes possible, indeed inevitable, when we all recognize there's one goal. There can be multiple paths, multiple missions to advance that one goal, but the one goal is God. Just of course, if we're coming from such very different places, God bestows upon his diverse children, inevitably, different paths to come to him. But once there is the universal realization that out of Zion shall go forth teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem, the light comes from here, then we all recognize there's just one goal. And of course, I want you to advance in your mission as you want me to advance in my mission because all of these missions are subordinated to the same essential goal. Broadcasting the light. Illuminating a dark world. Inevitably, I feel compelled to share with you one final dimension here, which is the subject of the remaining couple of sources, and that concerns how Jews and Christians are being summoned to stand together today. In the prophecy of Jeremiah, we encounter a critically important word in two very different contexts. The word is notzerim, which in biblical Hebrew has a very well-defined definition. The definition is watchmen, watchers. I'm stressing this point because that's the meaning of biblical Hebrew. But of course, afterward, in as much as Jesus is the Nazarene, the Notsri, those who followed him, Christians are the Notsarim. Same spelling. I want to stress the point here. Jeremiah is talking about watchmen. And yet, still in all, the word that he uses in post-biblical Hebrew means watchmen and Christians as well. Consider how this word Notsarim plays out in two very different passages in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 4, hark! One declares from Dan and announces calamity from the hills of Ephraim. Make you mention to the nations, behold, announce concerning Jerusalem, watchers, not serene, come from a far land and give out their voice against the city of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her roundabout? And these not serene are come to destroy. And then there's the Nutzrim in Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's begin in verse 2. From afar, God appeared unto me. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with kindness have I drawn you. Again will I build you, and you shall be built, O virgin of Israel. Again shall you be adorned with your tabrets, and shall go forth in the dances of them that make memory. Memory. Again shall you plant vineyards upon the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall redeem them. For there shall be a day that the watchman, the Notzerim, shall call upon Mount Ephraim. Arise and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. These are different Notzerim. They're also coming to Jerusalem, to Zion, but not to destroy. They're coming because they want to go up unto the Lord, our God. I know it's superfluous for me to note because you know far better than I 
that for most of the last two millennia, my people, for the most part, experienced Nutzavim, who were come to destroy. When the Crusaders, in the First Crusade, conquered Jerusalem in the year 1099, they slew every single man, woman, and child who was still in the city. They came to Jerusalem, but they came to destroy. Today, I see God-fearing Christians coming to Jerusalem with the conviction, arise and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. And I believe we have a mission to proclaim to the world together. As expressed in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, for then will I turn to the peoples a pure language that they may all call in the name of God to serve him shoulder to shoulder. Proclaiming that message to a world that isn't yet ready to hear. Indeed, a world in which often the forces of godlessness seem so daunting as to appear to us mere humans, invincible. The message of the Bible is we don't stop calling out in the name of God. We call in the name of God shoulder to shoulder. We take our cue again from Abraham, from Moses, from Jeremiah, from Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and from all those others who didn't compromise on proclaiming what was right simply because it wasn't expedient or politically correct. We declare what is right because it is right. God summoned us to be his junior partners. God gave us that charge and we are faithful to it. But you know, there is ultimately in all of this, not merely a charge, but also a consolation, a promise. Yes, when the day of God is at hand, it will be dark. It will be gloomy, thick darkness, as we saw in the words of the prophets. And the summons to illuminate, to be a light of the nations in such a dark world is daunting. And yet, at the same time, we have an old saying that a little bit of light banishes a whole lot of darkness. Tonight, we lit the first light of celebration of Hanukkah. The Maccabees, the heroes of the Hanukkah story, also lived, surrounded by the forces of godlessness. The Greeks and their Hellenist allies who regarded any devotion to God as just so obsolete, passe, primitive. But their rallying cry, as was Moses' rallying cry, whoever is on the side of God to me. And they went to battle. And a little bit of light dispelled a lot of darkness. And that continues to be a summons. A summons to us to this day as right around the winter solstice when the world is awfully dark, we're kindling the light. And of course, in a far more pervasive sense, with all the darkness that surrounds us, the light continues to shine and it shines from Jerusalem. And we're not going to stop shining the light 
because it's not politically correct or not expedient or inconvenient or because we don't know what the consequences will be, we declare God's word because it's right. Nothing else matters. May we indeed merit, nonetheless, to see the final culmination of these efforts. When that burning hunger and burning thirst that unbeknownst to all of the throngs of hungry and thirsty people out there is because they're really hungering and thirsting to hear the word of God, they'll be satisfied. Because knowledge of God will fill the earth as the waters cover the seabed. We do what's right, not because we know what the timetable of that blessed day is, but we know that by our heeding God's charge, we bring that day one step closer. We pave the way for the coming of the day of God, for the coming of the Messiah. We know we have many disagreements with respect to the particulars there, but we're focusing right now in this world. God will take care of the coming of the Messiah. But here and now, we have a summons, a challenge, a mission, paving the way, declaring the message to everyone, whether they are ready to hear it or not. Because by our being right by God, we know we're always on the winning side. May we always have the insight, the foresight, and most of all, the commitment to continue to broadcast that light, to illuminate the world, and to realize that God's summons today is for us to illuminate the world shoulder to shoulder. May we all have a luminous, brilliant, and blessed Hanukkah with the light that shines from here. Because out of Zion goes forth Torah, teaching, and the word of God from Jerusalem. Amen. God bless you.